welcome back to this fourth session on the second day of international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure after having heard the panel of distinguished experts policy makers and high ranking functionaries of governments and organizations on small island developing states on innovations and emerging technologies and the resilience of digital infrastructure systems the next session will talk about a very complex issue of urban resilience now as we are all aware that urban resilience is really multi layered and it is a issue where multiple infrastructure systems need to be integrated to actually achieve some kind of resilience while we have been working on long term strategic goals and objectives for example land use planning the standards and codes related to construction in urban areas the present covid-19 pandemic has thrown some unexpected uh, challenges to the urban planners so for example how do you ensure social distancing in an urban environment in rapid transport systems like metros or for example how do you ensure that the high density areas which the urban systems are are able to prevent the uh, transmission of diseases uh, that is a new issue so urban planners have to basically evolve their thinking in view of the pandemic and to discuss these and multiple other issues we have a eminent panel of experts policy makers we also have honorable minister of urban affairs of government of india mr mr hardeep singh puri who will deliver a keynote address to the session so uh, i will be handing over to the moderator of the session mr amit prothi amit has a uh, career of over 25 years he has worked in over 20 countries and with the organizations like world bank asian development bank and numerous numerous other government and international organizations he has worked on thematic topic areas directly which are related directly to urban resilience including land use planning disaster risk reduction and flood management recently he has managed the preparation of resilience strategies across asian cities including seoul and chennai so to take the this session forward now i am handing it over to mr amit prothi over to you amit thank you sandeep ji uh, thank you for that introduction uh, i am really excited to talk about this topic uh, i want to thank cdri for inviting me to moderate this very important session uh, i think most of you on this audience already know more than half of the world's population lives in cities and we're expected to add something like 2.5 billion more urban residents by 2050 cities are also contributing a considerable portion of our global gdp so when a disaster strikes it's not just about people's lives that are put at risk but considerable portion of the city's economy can also suffer we see that today where the pandemic has severely affected local economies as cities look to recover from the current pandemic they will still need to focus on long term risk reduction particularly related to increasing challenges posed by climate change therefore there is a strong imperative to focus on resilient infrastructure in the urban context building urban resilience is about understanding risk both from a perspective of reducing risk in the infrastructure that is planned and build infrastructure that's aimed at reducing risk in the urban system resilience infrastructure is both about physical infrastructure and social infrastructure today we really have an excellent group of speakers who bring a diverse set of perspective on this topic the format of the session will include a keynote address from the honorable minister hardeep singh puri a state setting presentation from dr tina combs from tu delft and a panel of discussant from three geographic regions david from ecuador mayor arujo from mozambique and ms sasha stolp from the netherlands and we'll have final comments from mr jagan shah senior advisor in the 
uh, in advisor in the Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office of the U UK government, given that there's a very important COP meeting coming up later this year. I also want to take a moment to welcome the participants of the Urban Resilience Masterclass, for whom this is the second session out of four sessions that has been organized for a global audience by CDRI. Lastly, but also importantly, we have Katie Chapel, who will be capturing the discussions of this session as a graphic. Katie is a virtual scribe and live event illustrator, best known for her fresh wobbly illustration and giant live window paintings. She has created live illustrations for global clients, including Apple, Facebook, Google, Chromebook, Dove, Nespresso, and many others. I'm going to take a moment here to see Katie's screen because I suspect it's blank. And then we will actually keep coming back to her to see what she's capturing graphically. So Katie, let's look at your screen for a minute. Great. So it's blank. It's coming soon. Um, let's get the session started. So it's really my honor to introduce Sri Hardeep Singh Puri, the Minister of State for Housing and Urban Affairs in the Government of India. Sri Puri has had a distinguished four decade career in diplomacy spanning the bilateral and multilateral arena, having held ambassadorial positions in London, Brazil, and as India's permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva and New York. He is one of the few Indians to preside over the UN Security Council and the only one to have chaired its counterterrorism committee. Sir, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, delighted. Uh, I feel privileged uh, to join such an eminent group of uh, discussants. I would very much have liked to be with you throughout the duration of the program, but you will appreciate that since I'm under a three-line whip, uh, uh, for a vote which is likely to take in, uh, take place in Parliament. I had actually pre-recorded my session, but then when I saw a little gap, I thought it's much better to interact with you um, on a real-time basis than send you a recorded statement. I am very happy to see some familiar faces, including my uh, collaborator who introduced me into this arena, Jagan uh, Shah. Uh, many others I have had the privilege of... Uh, uh, knowing uh, over the years that I spent in another profession. Let me start by uh, saying that um, disasters uh, are both uh, natural and man-made. That goes without saying. Uh, and resilience is something that we have to look at, not only in terms of the traditional narrative, uh, disaster resilience, sustainability, uh, you know, how you look at... Um, the capacity of state systems to respond uh, in an evolutionary manner. Uh, but that's one dimension. I think at the end of the day, uh, urban resilience in general and our ability to demonstrate resilience uh, is largely anchored in the human condition. Uh, you can have the most uh, ecologically sustainable infrastructure you could have built your buildings um, to withstand, you know, uh, seismic shocks, uh, uh, you know, man-made disasters coming from uh, mistakes or willful acts uh, of uh, aggression. But at the end of the day, when you are dealing with large populations, as we are in India, uh, large populations which... Um, uh, means that these are populations whose livelihoods you have to deal with and you're rebuilding the country. One of the statistics that uh, Jagan ac acquainted me to, uh, with, and which I'm very fond of using, so if I've used it in the past with you, please forgive me. But, you know, we have to build something like 700 to 900 million square meters of urban space every year, which is the equivalent of a Chicago. If you look at a city like Delhi, Delhi had a population of something like 800,000 in uh, 1947. When we had our first census in 1950-51, Delhi had a population of, I think, uh, twice or thrice that amount. Uh, 
Now, Delhi, by using, I'm, I forgive me for using Indian terms, the last census we had was 1911, and uh, sorry, 2011, and we had a population of 1.6 crores. That's what. Uh, 1.6 crores, which in the next uh, census will make it in the excess of 2 crores. That's a lot of people. Okay. Now, the way we are looking at Delhi, most of Delhi is being rebuilt. I mean, out of that population, I mean, I think some uh, 30, 30 to 40 percent are unauthorized colonies which are being regularized. Uh, there is Jahan Juggi Vahim Makan, you know, uh, to make sure that the um, people who are the poorest, economically weaker section, they are having their tenements rebuilt, informal settlements or slums as they are called, they are being redone. Now, in the midst of all that, in 2014, we had a new prime minister who undertook one of the most ambitious and far-reaching plans of urban rejuvenation attend attempted anywhere in the world. And we have programmatic interventions which have raised the expenditure on urban rejuvenation six times more than there was done in the last 10 years. In the midst of all that, a pandemic hit us. Why has India been able to deal with that pandemic? And I submit to you two or three reasons. One is that even though we had no knowledge, uh, because no past experience, I was ambassador in Geneva and New York uh, when we dealt with Ebola and SARS, um, uh, H1N1, many of these had a fatality rate, rate much higher. Uh, SARS had a uh, fatality rate of 17%. We in uh, um, uh, COVID now are doing less than 1%. Our recovery rate is 97, 98%. But it caused complete disruption. Why were we able to deal with it? The, the deadly uh, virus that struck the world first in China, then uh, stealthily spread as a full-blown pandemic across the world, provided a global inflection point. And I think that one of the things which saved us was that, and, and, and I'm not trying to draw comparisons, I think comparisons are odious. Many countries which had much smaller populations, much better developed healthcare systems, uh, they had the uh, bandwidth for um, spending, and yet we came out of it looking much better. Uh, we were able to utilize the timing of the lockdown, which was very severe and comprehensive, starting in March of 2020. Uh, we were able to do that to develop our healthcare system. Uh, we did not produce PPEs, ventilator, vent ventilators. Uh, we were first, we've always been the vaccine uh, uh, pharmacy of the world, supplying uh, basic uh, generic drugs to the rest of the world. We were quick in supplying hydroxychloroquine and other drugs to the rest of the world. But we did something much better. We were able to bring in essential medical supplies from outside in the midst of the lockdown, repatriate our citizens who were locked outside, um, uh, you know, had lost their jobs or were at a loose end. We brought, we transported something like 6.6 .6 million people uh, under Vande Bharat scheme. Uh, we have a Vaitri vaccine. We are one of the few countries in the world which is not only manufacturing the vaccine, an indigenous, an indigenous one uh, with Bharat Biotech, but one in collaboration uh, with AstraZeneca, but the other ones are also nearing the emergency authorization stage. And we are supplying vaccines now to under our bilateral um, goodwill arrangements or uh, Gavi, etc., to dozens of other countries. Why were we able to do this? And I think this is something on which I want to speak in terms of uh, urban uh, resilience. Let me, therefore, uh, put through my you know, thoughts straight from the heart, as it were. And let me say, even at the cost of sounding immodest, and confess that both as an Indian and as a minister in the Council of Ministers of the Prime Minister, Shri Modi, I feel an immense sound, sense of pride in the way India has dealt with this crisis in the urban sphere. You know, 
I don't want to talk about the programmatic interventions and the uh, flagship programs, all of which have been a rearing, uh, roaring success. But when the pandemic broke out, there was something that we did, and I think that is essential to point on that, is that the Prime Minister made us, individuals, ministers and the government, many of us, speak to literally hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, each day we would be given a specified task, a different state, where we would, let's say, reach out to some people who were associated with the manufacturing processes, whose supply lines had been disrupted, industrialists, artists, members of civil society, NGOs. I must have spoken, I think, at least to a thousand people on a one-to-one -one basis. And we asked them simple questions like, are you comfortable with the lockdown that has been organized? Do you think that time has come to make a decision in choosing between life, which is a lockdown, and issues of livelihood to open the economy? And believe me that results, the feedback we got was filtered through a group of ministers and fed up. That, I believe, is the essential core of decision-making for urban resilience in an economy like India's. I mean, I know there are not too many people with our kind of developmental challenges, countries with a population of 1.3 plus billion plus people. But we were able to get the timings right. Let me uh, give you two examples from my own two ministries civil aviation for which I have independent charge and housing and urban affairs. One of the lessons we learned was that normal civil aviation operations had to be closed because of the spread of the virus, but you wanted to use the same infrastructure for dealing with the problems of the pandemic, transporting medicine, transporting people when everything else was closed down. And the fact that we were able to resume domestic civil aviation by putting in place SOPs, other precautions through our airport. On a good day, pre-COVID, we used to have 350,000 plus passengers a day. When we closed operations on 23rd March and reopened on 25th May, we had only 30,000 passengers a day. When we opened up slowly by following SOPs, we reached a stage where we were at 313,000 already. I used to say with a degree of pride that when we start the summer schedule on 1st April, we will be able to get back to pre-COVID level. No, I see the signs of a possible second wave of the pandemic and therefore we are going to go a little slower. Therefore, I've taken the position that we have now civil aviation open up to 80%. We will open it to 100% when on three days we get 350,000, not consecutively, but in a month, we will open the thing up. Now, the pandemic destroyed many myths and many reputations. Advanced healthcare systems, which were touted to be the best in the world, crumpled within time. Maybe, and I come back to the same issue, the decision making. You can have the best healthcare system in the world, but if you don't know when you need to effect a lockdown and when you can afford to open up, you can make mistakes. I have uh, uh, stories of uh, holiday resorts in Europe, very popular ones, I'm not going to name any, which thought everything was all right. You could you know, open it up to tourism. My God, there was an immediate flare-up, which resulted in countries in smaller places going into a second and more effective lockdown. Close to India, uh, we had the same story. But we have been very cautious. We have been conscious. And the Prime Minister in particular has been leading up front. He has spoken on a regular basis to all the chief ministers, including, I believe, yesterday. And he monitors the evolving situation. He monitors how much vaccine we are able to produce, and between those two who have the authorization, 
to ensure there is no vaccine wastage. Now, I believe it is this kind of a leadership from up front which has helped us to overcome the immediate challenges. But again, that even that exemplary leadership would not have succeeded, I believe, if in 2014 we hadn't embarked upon the Swachta scheme. For those of our friends who have joined us from other countries, let me say it's a sanitation program. You know, when the Prime Minister of India announced from the ramparts of the Red Fort, when he first interacted in that setting, he said it was his dream. This was 15th August 2014, that by the time we celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of the Mahatma, that is the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, India should be open defecation free. Now, to, for any outsiders who don't know us, they might think, oh my God, India has to do that. Yes, not only India, many other developing countries in the world have to deal with it. Partly as a cultural pro uh, issue, partly as an infrastructure issue. But, you know, we built toilets, hundreds of thousands in the rural areas, in the urban areas. But we succeeded in doing something more. We succeeded in ensuring that there was behavioral change. People realized the value of what urban sanitation was, what rural sanitation was. And I think from one end of the sanitation campaign to the other end of the spectrum, when we built our smart cities, we have 100 of them. We have 50 integrated command and control uh, centers in place. They became war rooms during the pandemic. They were able, with the help of technology, with the use of the latest uh, uh, in terms of monitoring all urban amenities, ensure that we, had, we were up to date with the information, knew where to reach out, whom to supply. Our civil aviation system, our uploading of medical supplies took two to six minutes. Off, uh, offloading took between two and 18 minutes. So you, we had production centers. You could take them from there to transport them throughout the country. You had last mile connectivity. And yet we were able to do that in a seamless effort. Now to do that in a democracy is even more difficult. I submit to you why. Because we have a healthy opposition, which is quite happy to, first they said, why is the vaccine not being, uh, 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 you know, why, why is the lockdown? Then when we opened up, you opened up too soon. Uh, you know, millions of people are going to die. You know, they were picking up stuff from here and there. But, you know, if you look at the overall uh, recovery rate and the fatality ratio, uh, we are not out of it yet, but I can say with a degree of confidence that we can compare with any other country. All this because of a determined, resolute leadership, systems in place, and an urban system with the urban programmatic interventions, water supply, healthcare system. Today we have a system that uh, from not making ventilators, we are now exporting ventilators, PPEs, enough hospital beds. So God forbid, even if you have to face the challenges of a second uh, wave, uh, I hope we don't have to. And we can discourage our those of our countrymen who like to party big time and uh, throw procedures to the winds. We are ready to do that. But that's what a democracy is all about. And all I can tell you is that at the end of the day, I don't know how to categorize the pandemic. My initial education in uh, disaster management was there are, hum there are natural disasters, you know, floods, earthquakes. There are man-made disasters. I don't know what the um, uh, pandemic is. Uh, it could be characterized as um, falling in both categories. To some extent, there may be the errors in laboratories or whatever happened, wherever it came from, wet markets elsewhere. I don't want to go into that debate. But to be able to deal with that in the coming years, I'm glad you're having this discussion. And I think the lessons drawn from it, especially after the panels, I'm afraid I won't be able to join you for much longer. But I will draw on my friend Jagan to give me, after all, he, when he, you have three very eminent panelists. But when Jagan draws that up, we would like to gain from that. 
what is it that you are discussing with such eminent expertise some of the lessons which we can plow back into our programmatic intervention and i am sure that the leadership in the country even at the level of the prime minister uh, will gain from this and uh, thank you very much for having me with you thank you sir that was really um, very thought provoking but also in a way echoes a number of things that you know i work for a city network around the world and some of the things that you've been saying actually has echoed back points that i've been hearing from the other cities strong leadership the discussion around lives and livelihoods from this pandemic i think when a disruption happens people's lives are affected and so are livelihoods and how do you deal with that um the whole notion of repurposing i think you mentioned the airline industry how you had to repurpose that's happened again and again and again across a variety of governments where they've had to repurpose because governments has has to they've they've literally repurposed how they function um what's interesting is if you look historically as well historically plagues have actually changed dramatically changed cities and so i think we are all sitting at the cusp of trying to understand how will this pandemic change our cities i don't think we have a clear answer yet but hopefully we get there um and and, and what are the systems that need to be in place sir i really appreciate all of these comments and hope i can i can i uh, please, take please. advantage of your hospitality to make just two points please uh you know in another profession in which i spent 40 years whenever we spoke of reform in a system and i'm talking about the un whenever i try to as permanent representative in new york in particular we should talk about reform of the structure i was always reminded that the existing architecture for governance i mean the united nations the international monetary fund the world bank uh, the world trade organization and before that the general agreement on tariffs and trade these were born out of a crisis yes in fact the un was conceived in san francisco whilst the second world war was still going on So when I used to talk of reform, some of my uh, very good friends, but uh, not um, likely to be persuaded by my argumentation, said, "You know, but we did this when the world war was on. You will need to have another war." I used to tell them, "Be careful, be careful. Crisis can come not only in the form of, you know, wars and world wars, but crisis can come. You don't know where." I think the pandemic. has driven home to all of us the values of good urban governance translated down to urban local bodies but also strong leadership let me give you an example when i was newly appointed as a minister in 2017 i went to a place called i think bhopal in indore and indore year after year in a survey we do on urban sanitation comes out number 1 so i wanted to go into the reasons why this swachhta sarvekshan which is an annual survey why some cities do well invariably invariably the answer is a good chief minister a good local mayor look mayors have an importance in urban issues which we are not able to understand therefore i am very unhappy about the fact that our mayors are not there for long term because i lived in new york you know if you see who cleaned up crime in new york giuliani's name came from but if you have a mayor only for a year by the time the poor man or woman is settling down you know we have another so we are trying to refocus on that with the 73rd and 74th amendment but i think countries have a crisis you know if you make a mistake some of the countries which had the best healthcare systems in the world were casual about the response equally on climate change look when you are talking about urban resilience it's very closely tied down to climate i have some brilliant notes which i'm going to put out with my staff at prepared i mean the the nexus between climate uh, uh, resilience you know the response urban resilience people realize if you get buildings done we are not changing our technology totally we are trying to make buildings which are not toxic we are talking about innovative we had a global technology uh, construction challenge we whole year was declared so urban resilience is much more than its classical definition and i want to submit that and i apologize for taking more time but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you very much sir and actually it goes right into our next uh, speaker um 
Dr. Tina Combs, uh, who's the Delft Technology Fellow and Associate Professor at the Faculty Technology Policy and Management at TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, she's an eminent planner, and I don't. I think I will save some time. And Dr. Tina, over to you. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, and also for my part, I'm thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I will try to uh, speed up a bit. <laughs> and um, yeah, so. Uh, Thanks again for giving me the opportunity to speak. And indeed, so some of the issues mentioned will come up also in my presentation. I'm trying to refocus and bring us back again to the issues of urban resilience. And because I'm trying to be brief, you can also find like my contact details. If you have any questions, just let me know, because as we know, this is also a masterclass and you know, working at the university, we are also all trainers and teachers. Next slide. Yeah, so you already um, heard that I'm working at the TU Delft, which is the oldest and the largest technical university in the Netherlands. What we are trying to do in the lab is become a reference point for inter interdisciplinary research to promote resilient societies. And we do that by leveraging both the technology, but also the engineering knowledge and the data driven approaches that are developed on campus and then interact with practice and policymakers to really push the boundaries of academic research, but also to provide concrete tools to make a case for policy change and action. Next slide. Now, that was already mentioned in the very beginning. Um, we do know that you know, cities obviously need to, uh, need to be a driver of climate adaptation, because if we want to have a, to have a chance with um, mitigating climate change, then we need to start in our cities. That's where most of our population is based. And that is, of course, a lot of pressure on uh, urban planning. But at the same time, if we look at this map of where the fastest growing cities are located, we see that most of them are actually in coastal regions. So that means they are extremely um, opposed to challenges such as sea level rise. Next slide. And at the same time, you know, these cities are also growing because people go there um, with a prospect of economic growth, equality, better infrastructure than in rural areas. So if we talk about urban resilience, it is very clear that we have to deal with all these pressures and challenges at the same time. Improving our cities so that they can, you know, accommodate more people and help them lead better lives, um, be a catalyst of Climate, uh, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, and then also become resilience, resilient against the challenges that are coming towards us in the context of climate change. And that is both like trends such as sea level rise, as well as more and more extreme weather events. Next slide. Now, the way that uh, we define resilience, and that is also nicely uh, matching to what we just heard, is that it's not just sort of the classic conventional reliability engineering where you have an infrastructure that quickly recovers from a shock or stress, um, but that we are really talking about a socio-technical system that is the people that use the infrastructure and um, live in the city together with sort of the systems we build. And that we look at both the response to shocks as well as the um, adaptation and reorganization um, as we are, for instance, talking about climate change. Now, that was all quite abstract, so let me make it more concrete. Next slide. If we are talking about cities, then one of the key challenges is that even within the very same city, you can have very different uh, infrastructure systems and very different uh, patterns of how people live there. So this is an image of Mumbai. Now, we are proposing to use data-driven approaches to understand how the infrastructure we built, and we just had heard a lot about WASH infrastructure as well, so how that infrastructure helps to make our communities and our cities more resilient. And the starting point for that can be understanding how infrastructure development correlates with socioeconomic resilience. Next slide. Uh, click one more. should see images there. Thank you. So this is a project where we, um, where we look at urban resilience analytics. So what I said before, we use machine learning approaches, um, artificial intelligence, to understand how infrastructure systems and behavior 
um, relate uh, relate to each other and how we can understand the resulting inequalities. So this is a map on the left side, you see uh, the road network of Helsinki and how it's evolved between 1983 and 2016. And on the right, you see um, the mapping, a mapping and analysis of socioeconomic resilience in Helsinki. And you can see, if you look very closely, that actually where more new infrastructure is built, um, socioeconomic um, resilience is better. So just also as a plea, we can use these approaches to co-shape how the infrastructures also determine the social and economic aspects. Next one. So, of course, we already had a lot, <laughs> heard now a lot about COVID. Um, so I definitely don't have to introduce it. Next slide. But what was already also mentioned, so this is a mapping about different countries, how, uh, how, how they were hit by COVID. But we also do see that cities are hit hardest. That is probably not surprising because indeed we have a high population density and we know that COVID is transmitted through people interacting with each other. But there are still also a lot of things that we do not know about COVID-19. That is one, we don't, for instance, know how people interact and how they comply to the measures that are introduced. But also secondly, we are now talking about new variants and variants of concern of the virus or the effectiveness of vaccines. Next slide. And as you are all um, you know, in the cities starting to think about how to organize the city, um, to uh, protect the population from COVID-19, what we are doing is build simulation models to help policymaking with that step. And importantly, this is a way for you to simulate, um, create an artificial city environment where you can try and test out the impact of policies without like trying it out on your population and throwing it on that. Um, next slide. What we did, for instance, in the HEROES project, which is one of um, my ongoing EU funded project is we were looking at the, the impact of certain policies on The Hague. And one of the interesting findings that you see here, so we, we do model how people in the city move about um, and where they are infected and then how these infection clusters arise. We were expecting initially to see them mostly in the city center, which is sort of in the center of the map that you see there. Um, but surprisingly, because interaction and traveling through the center is limited because we are actually currently still in a lockdown. Um, we see that the clusters arise more in a ring in the periphery around the city where people then do get infected. So this is one way where we can trace where, where infections actually still happen and what the impact is of, for instance, lockdown or different reopening policies. Also the, the new variants, for instance. Now a on the almost final slide, next. Um, a plea, the, the masterclass people have received that paper, so maybe some of you have already seen, seen this graph. Um, together with Supriya, who is also has been working on this session, um, we have also been looking at how can we improve um, urban resilience for, 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 the for a changing climate, and what are the differences between what is currently done within academia, so some of the things I talked about here today, and what is actually done, implemented, or looked for in practice. And we do see that there, there are still you know, different perceptions, there are different priorities, um, maybe not surprisingly, but what I'm really very much looking forward to in this session, and also if we can continue the dialogue, I would be very happy to, is sort of to bring together what we can do as researchers in academia with what you need and what your questions are in practice, because I do think that only together we can advance urban resilience. Thank you. You're on mute. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Gomez. That was really nice and sweet and short, but also very relevant. I think you highlighted the opportunity to leverage data. Um, you know, simulating policies, that's really important at this point when governments are trying to understand what direction to take, uh, but also using it to understand where, where one sees the infections being clustering, etc. Um, I want to just take a minute because I've been seeing Katie has been busy drawing and she was trying to capture what you were talking about. So rather than me trying to summarize, maybe Katie, can we look at what you've been drawing? Okay. 
there we go research and tools for policy change so that gets into the simulation uh, sea level rise i think you talked about how coastal cities you know there are more and more and more people living on the coast and the coastal areas are getting more and more vulnerable so i think there is really something there one has to focus on um, bridging the gap between research and practice i think that actually is perfect for our next segment um, so thank you katie i would like to then maybe move on to our panelists because we really have three practitioners coming up now um, and let me introduce them first is the mayor is mayor manuel arojo from uh, kelimane in the economic political and administrative capital of mozambique's zambezia province and the country's fifth largest city which has close to 400,000 inhabitants um, the second panelist comes from latin america david uh, who i know very well um, is the currently the metropolitan director of residence at the municipality of quito in ecuador and the chief residence officer as part of the residence cities network hence i know him well um, and the third speaker comes from Europe. Ms. Sacha Stolp is the Director of Innovation for Future Proof Assets for the City of Amsterdam, uh, which basically is from, she's part of a crossover program between the Department of Engineering and the Department of Urban Management. I think one thing we are hearing today again and again is when we're talking about resilience, it's not just about the physical infrastructure, but also about people. Uh, and just this, you know, um, so I think we're going to hear some of explanation of that a little bit more in some of these conversations. Um, I'm going to start the panel discussion and Mayor Arujo, I'm going to start with you. So can you provide us with a brief description of your city to essentially help the audience understand the various shocks and stresses that affect Kilimani and how these shocks and stresses have impacted the lives of people and the infrastructure of your city. Mayor, over to you. Mayor Arujo, I think you're on mute. You're right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Amit and uh, Priya and the whole team for inviting me to be here today with you to share, to, to, to learn from the other panelists' experience, but also to give us to give us the opportunity to share our own experience in Kilimane. As Amit said, Kilimane is a coastal city. It's also a port city. And it was built on a swamp on the banks of the Bon Sinai River, making it very vulnerable to climate change events. For example, in the last three years, we suffered five cyclones. In 2019, we had uh, cyclone Idai, which destroyed almost 90% of uh, a neighboring city, which is the Debeira city, which is like 30 minutes by flight from Kelimane. But also in a space of two months, we had uh, another cyclone, cyclone Kenneth, which uh, was on the north, which uh, uh, and also destroyed most of the, the city of of, of, of Pemba. This year alone, in 2021, we had uh, three cyclones already. Cyclone Eloise, Cyclone Chalan, and Cyclone Guande. So this raises the importance of urban re re resilience. And uh, the issue of urban re resilience has been a concern to most local governments in the light of the accentuated climate change related activity. I mean, this concern of course has led to more research and investment, not only in technologies, but also in infrastructure and uh, manpower. Of course, these challenges are not only affecting Kalimani or Mozambique. I think this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is a global concern the, of uh, local mayors and local government to look for solutions that uh, are really more durable and uh, more cost uh, if, if effective. Uh, 
as I mentioned, I don't know if uh, we could move to the next page. No, okay. So what have we done given the challenges that we are facing? Uh, Kalimani City, we must say that uh, is one of the first, if not actually the first local authority or local city to have a local adaptation plan. This ad 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 adaptation plan was approved by the municipal assembly. And we were able of designing this local adaptation plan with support of some regional and international entities. Because this, I'm highlighting this to draw the attention for the need of building local capacity. Uh, at my municipality, we wouldn't alone, we wouldn't have been able of coming up with a local adaptation plan. So we had to identify regional, national, and also international partners that helped us in this process of um, coming up with, uh, or in, coming up in designing a local adaptation plan. We also managed to come up with a, a vulnerability map for the mun municipality, which show us uh, the dangers different areas of the, the, the city have. And if somebody or an entity wants to build an infrastructure, we are able today, based on this vulnerability map, to advise the entity or the person on which steps to take to minimize or to mitigate the, 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 the vulnerability. We also are uh, embarked into a permanent education campaign for communities on the effects of climate change and the ways to address uh, its challenges, but, but also to adapt to the ch challenges that uh, we are facing. We are also working with community-based or, or organization in the process of implementing some of the measures that, that are outlined in our local adaptation plan. For example, the first line of defense from erosion, but also from flooding, are uh, the mangroves. But because people are poor, they do cut those mangroves, either for building their own houses or for cooking. So what we did actually was to engage and to create youth clubs, women environmental clubs, and also student climate or environmental clubs where we go and we inform them about the importance of the mangroves, not only for the biodiversity, but also for the protection of the city. As I mentioned, our first line of protection from Erosion, given that we are, as I mentioned, we are a coastal city, therefore we suffer. And, 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 and actually, I also mentioned that Kenimano was built on a swamp and on the banks of a river. Therefore, we suffer the effects, not only of sea rise level, but also the effects of uh, rain or flooding coming from the rain. And actually, sometimes, it coincides at the same time, making it even more difficult to manage the consequences. So we teach these communities in these groups that we created the importance of, of the mangroves to not only to biodiversity, but as I mentioned, also to protect our city from er erosion. The question that arises from this community is that, look, we understand the importance of the mangroves, but what are the alternatives? And here is where we are looking for partners and other stakeholders to help us to come up with alternatives so that we can be able of protecting the mangroves. For example, we managed to come up or to make a partnership with the UN Habitat where we build the first 10 resilient houses. These houses are built using local techniques and local ma materials that will then allow our communities to build or rebuild their houses without uh, cutting the mangroves. But of course, we need more, we need to scale it up. We had this as a, a, a pilot example. We also came up with another pilot example where we used waste to, we 
to produce biogas. So this also, is, it was a way to answer to those who are saying that we need alternatives for the use of mangroves for cooking. So we identified that we can transform the waste that we collect in the city, and then from that uh, uh, waste, we can create biogas. Of course, as I mentioned, this also is a, a pilot project that we are looking for partners and other uh, 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 to scale it up so that we, we, we are able to respond to the challenges that uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are facing. So we have been also working to spread more information about climate change and the adaptation methods and techniques among those communities, among the students, the women, and uh, the, the youth. Uh, we have been also working with within the municipality to raise up the level of awareness for the need to have, when approving projects, to be aware of the recommendations that our vulnerability map drawn. We also defined measures to save water introduce collection and use of rainwater in the municipality, as well the sewage water treatment and reuse. As I mentioned before, we are promoting waste recycling and reuse, not only for biogas, but also transforming part of, of the waste into compost. So by doing that, we manage to improve not only the yields, the productivity, but also the production level of uh, uh, our farmers within the urban rural area. We are also defining a clear guideline of resilience and we are reinforcing the local laws that, that are leading actually to a major performance on the resilience way. We have been working to enhance the partnership between the public, the private sector, in securing and enhancing the security and the resilience of critical infrastructure. Like uh, when public buildings are being built like schools, streets, or clinics, we make sure that uh, our environment and climate change specialists are there so that uh, resilience guidelines are followed strictly. Uh, we are also developing and working to encourage private businessmen to perform periodic risk assessment and implement risk reduction programs. Actually, I did not mention before that I equally, I'm also the co-chair of the uh, risk management and uh, resilience at the Global Ex Ex Executive Committee. So we bring that experience that from the international level but to the local, but also we take what we are doing, sharing with other, not, not only with other mayors, but also with the other international organizations that they bring together mayors and uh, other local government of officials. And given that, just to finalize, given that 80% of the municipality population lives actually on agricultural activity, and uh, because of the phenomena of salt intrusion and uh, increasingly soil salinity, we are working with farmers to teach them ways of improving the quality of the soil, thus avoiding the salt water intrusion either from the sea or from the river. By doing so, of course, we are protecting also the land available for agriculture, not only for ag agriculture, but also for building infrastructure. And uh, we, just to finalize, as I was saying, we feel that an effective resilience is built up with an entire collaboration of all sectors in the municipality, starting with the community, the private sector, the public sector, churches, civil society, and others. And the aim is to reach and efficiency on the resilience, taking actions to bring more knowledge to the community, 
thus improving their income or the income of those who are less privileged. Thus, ca coming up with an inclusion in a, a with a strategy that includes not only the most productive of our society, but also including the most vulnerable. Thank you. Very, very thank, very thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arusha. That was really helpful, and you really helped to provide a very, uh, you know, good understanding of the stresses and shocks that your city faces. The fact it's on the river, the fact it faces um, flooding, the fact, you know, I really appreciated hearing you talk about a vulnerability map because that's often not something a lot of cities have done. And then using that to actually guide your infrastructure decisions, I think that is really commendable and that more and more cities need to do that. And the other thing I really, really, really liked was your working with community for them to understand risks from climate change. Uh, and then, you know, the whole notion of preserving mangroves is not an easy decision because people are relying on their livelihoods and lives. And the pressure on you to then get the community to understand, the, you know, you need to preserve mangroves because they're protecting the whole community and yet they need livelihood as well. Which actually gets me very well to the next panelist. Uh, David, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, David and Quito, I mean, the city of Quito has been focused on urban resilience for the past few years. Uh, David, can you briefly discuss how Quito has approached urban resilience and how the efforts that you have been undertaken have helped to support vulnerable populations, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you, David, over to you. Um, thank you, Amit, and I will be happy to share our experience. Um, Quito launched a comprehensive uh, resilience strategy in, in 2017, and the main aim um, of the strategy is to strengthen different critical systems to build resilience. As a result, our job is supported primarily by a robust participation system where neighborhood leaders, for example, are prepared to plan for, uh, for their community's development under our resilience lens. This gives ground to other actions in other realms, such as, for example, conserving nature in and around the city or urban development around our mass, uh, mass uh, transit, transit system, especially when we are uh, finishing the first metro line of the city in order to give an inclusive voice to support these efforts. Um, at the same time, uh, as part of the resilience strategy, the food economy is one of the objectives supported uh, in the fourth pillar uh, in, in, in the same strategy, aiming at having a solid and resourceful economy. This is actually about long-term planning for, for resilience. When analyzing uh, the SDGs, for example, uh, where we could have multiple, uh, multiple different entries. And uh, by aiming to one of them, we can cause uh, systemic change. And this is what we are aiming um, while uh, working uh, in this way, if it is planned properly. So for example, if uh, by achieving zero hunger, um, it is understandable that it is possible to also contribute to provide better access to education, for example. Uh, kids are uh, better uh, prepared to, to attend classes and so on. And later on uh, to uh, um, uh, get uh, better livelihoods uh, while also working on the, on the uh, job um, offer uh, system of the city, of course. And this is important uh, because uh, if informal settlements are the result of the efforts made by people to provide a home for their own by using scarce resources, then reducing economic inequality becomes important to steer this type of developments and contribute to a better uh, way uh, in a better way to the SDG 11. So, uh, as you can see, we are aiming to work in a, in a, in a, uh, under a systems, systems lens uh, fashion. Um, so, uh, as a result, understanding what the drivers that what the drivers are that cause food insecurity um, and how it is distributed in the territory, this allows this allows the city to work ac accordingly. The premise is that if there is one single person with food insecurity, then this is an indicator of a malfunctioning system, food system. And this is what we are trying to prevent and what we are trying to fix. 
Um, in, two, in 2020, the coronavirus pandemic hit the world in Quito and, and pretty hard, um, um, I would say, the city. That changed all of our maps and understanding of how food insecurity was happening in the city. A lot more people had no access to food and the reasons were also uh, a little bit different than the ones that we had before, since in this case, no one was able to leave home that provided additional challenges. So if resilience is basically having a system to reorganize, to keep having essentially the same function, in this case, uh, to keep providing nutritious and healthy food for everyone, then that was the main task. And I would like to highlight uh, two actions here as part of our response. Uh, first of all, the urban farming program that has been going on in the city of Quito for a couple of decades. But um, as part of the resilience strategy, um, the program was, has been strengthened and amplified. This program supports around 1,500 families to produce local and organic food for their own consumption. 80% of them are uh, family, uh, uh, woman-led families, either single mothers or head of households. And the 50% of those families produce, uh, make that produce for their own subsistence. Um, and the, these families uh, in the context of the coronavirus were better prepared than others uh, to face uh, food, the, the, the difficulties to access food. Um, and furthermore, actually, they were able to help others that were in a more desperate situation uh, with their surplus, surplus production. So in a sense, uh, the system was able to, uh, in, in, the, in that part of the system was able to support others that were somehow ex excluded from the system. The second action was the support provided by neighborhood leaders, uh, which is basically the result of the highly, of a highly participatory processes, process that we were, that we have been uh, carrying on in the city uh, for quite a while now. So in a context where informality prevents having enough and accurate data and information uh, to have a better response to help, especially the most needed, neighborhood, neighborhood leaders were able to jump in and support um, the help provided by the, by the municipality of Quito and other actors uh, coming from the private sector, uh, for example, to help us identify where, where these um, very needed people are located and to provide assistance so that we, we were able to distribute food and, and allevi alleviate their needs. I think these two actions account on how to manage ur urban complex systems to, be, to build resilience, especially when there are high levels of informality and lack of information and data. And uh, also as, as a result, provide these systems with adaptive capacities by creating redundancies uh, and allowing subsystems to reorganize in different ways to keep the system uh, running. Um, I hope this, this experience contributes uh, to these very important interesting conversations and I'm very much looking forward to hear uh, what comes uh, in the next points. Thank you, David. Thank you really for highlighting the importance of focusing on people. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I've always appreciated of, about Quito is the focus on individuals and community building social resilience amongst community members, right? The focus on food security, for example, had started before the pandemic. It was already something that you as a city were focused on. You know, the, the intention of achieving zero hunger in your community was happening before the pandemic. And I think when the pandemic hit, you were much, much better prepared than a lot of other cities to, to you know, mobilize that system and feed the community. So I think that's an important point to remember. It's not just about physical infrastructure. It's actually a lot about people uh, and social, uh, social resilience as well. Uh, thank you, David. So my third uh, panelist is Ms. Sacha Stolp. Uh, and Ms. Stolp, I think my question comes to you, which is, um, uh, it's literally saying, you know, thinking about the, the context of Amsterdam and starting to understand for all of us, how is Amsterdam preparing and taking decisions, particularly to address increasing risks related to climate change? And then in your role as director of innovation, how have you been working within the city government to prepare the city for disruptions given the uncertainty related to climate change? 
And then how are you balancing the need for long-term planning that is needed for climate change with current focus on recovering from COVID? So really, how are you balancing the immediate response with the long-term needs of, uh, of your city? So over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I appreciate it that I'm uh, welcome here to uh, share uh, our experience. Um, well, uh, Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a small uh, country in Europe. Uh, and, well, we're probably most famous for Johan Cruijff, who is a very famous soccer player, but uh, and we're also famous for our old city. It, uh, but not many people know that we are actually the end of the Alp system, which is the central mountain district within Europe. And its water is flowing through our, uh, to our country, to the sea. And so we are more or less the same than Quelimane, and I have to say it right. And, and we are an, a delta city uh, built in the swamps of what used to be the western part of the Netherlands, or what is the western part of the Netherlands, but we used to be the swamps. And we are a historical delta city. We exist for around uh, 750 years. And we're not only physically an old city, but we also have, well, let's say, institutions who are there for a long time. So we don't only have the government, the local government, but we actually have a water board because the Netherlands is famous for its water management and, 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 and building, especially within the lower deltas. And it's protecting us. And it's, well, it protects us so well that usually the people who are living in the Netherlands, they are not aware that they're living under sea level. And so we are vulnerable for climate change, but the awareness in our society of this problem is quite low because it's arranged so well. So I think, and now I'm doing sure to everybody who has well suffered from COVID-19 and, and has lost in his families, I think COVID-19 is also a wake-up call for our generation and especially our generation because we hadn't faced shocks for such a long time, actually. And my grandparents, they lived in the Second World War, World War and they told me, of course, stories when I was a small child, but it was so far away and they were so old. And, ah, well, it was an other era. But actually, our city was built in an era before our time. Um, well, let's say, for instance, we are now uh, replacing bridges and canal wall systems and, and roads, which were built for horses and carriage. Those people, the engineers from the past, they, they didn't have a clue that we're going to have trucks and, uh, and that we're going to have Teslas with large, better, large and heavy batteries. So... Our city is vulnerable due to the fact that we are there for such a long time and our systems are there for such a long time. So what are we doing to make ourselves more ready and more resilient? Now, one of the things, I'm going to push my cat a little bit away, so, um, <laughs> is uh, that we are facing this national program and we incorporate this, and it's on the, uh, the National Climate Adaptive Strategy. So we mapped our stress for extreme heat, for extreme rainfall, drought, and sea level rise to our city. And that's where the, the stress test is on climate adaptation. And I think that, that made it very clear where are our vulnerabilities and how can we um, uh, take measurements within our regular assignment uh, 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 program? On the other hand, we widened our regular stress test. We used to have a stress test only based on financial components, but we're now having a stress test for the first time, not only on economic and financially, but also on other stress actors, like, for instance, climate change, but also on megatrends, because they're also very uh, important. Let's say cyber uh, crime or a uh, cyber attack and uh, a demographic shock or, or climate change. And actually, we, we have now uh, marked the 
the, the, the former uh, stress actors like financial and economic as traditional. And we have added the other megatrends. And, and that, of course, gives us an idea of what shocks and stresses are doing for our physical, social and financial sector. But that's still very high level. And the thing is, we want to know how do we have to act? And that's why we also have a bottom-up approach. I think I like the third part the most, because that's where we uh, cooperate together with Knowledge Institute, but also with our local partners and not only our contractors, but also with the people in the streets and people living actually. So it's this triple helix approach and it's, it's this quadruple helix approach. And we are even making right now a podcast talking with front runners locally who are doing things together with people from the Knowledge Institutes and bringing them together using our maintenance assignment as a field lab uh, um, for, for new ideas, new materials, but also these new approaches, bringing together all these stakeholders. And we also have a living lab program together with students. And well, if I can shift my work week in three parts, this is actually the most fun part. Um, yeah, well, this is the way we approach it. And, and as I mentioned, uh, 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 COVID was a wake up call. And um, well, there are the other things I can tell. Uh, th thank you so much. I think um, it's interesting. I picked up some new, new vocabulary, which is not new to me, but I think it's worth highlighting is the whole legacy issue, right? The, when you're building infrastructure, it's going to last you for 50, 70, 100, 200 years. Yep. And we can't predict everything that's going to come our way, but we have to be, you know, we, we already understand certain risks that are emerging related to climate change, particularly for coastal areas for other cities. Yep. And as we are starting to put in new infrastructure in place, we are creating legacies for the future. And I think it's important to start understanding how is the current infrastructure planning going to be affected by the future changes that are coming. And I, you know, I, I heard you talk about that, you know, testing your stress test, for example, is now broader beyond financial uh, and economic to actually include climate change. And also the whole notion of the bottom up and getting more and more people aware and engaged, which is also something we heard from both David and the mayor, right? I think it's yeah. the whole, people have to understand why you're making these decisions. Yeah, it's, it's not uh, only the people, but it's the complete approach of our economy, actually, because yeah. we have to learn to adapt yeah. within an assignment and within the lifespan of things which we try to build for 100 years or 50 years. I yeah. think that's what is completely new. And to give you an example of a complete useless in investment, because that's... Uh, uh, the Netherlands tried to build a wall system around Amsterdam. Well, it was uh, in the 19th century, actually, they started. And it was ready before World War II. But they forgot that it was a world war with airplanes. So they built a construction based on all thinkings about a uh, war and how it would go previously. So it was completely useless when we needed it. And, and I think this is what we have to take in consideration. How are we going to evaluate the things we are doing while we are doing them and then become, well, and, and adapt these new circumstances? For instance, we know that, that, that like the uh, IPCC will have new reports about how the climate is changing every five to 10 years. Yeah. How are we going to incorporate this new way of thinking? Well, sometimes uh, city development is, is, is during 25 years. Yeah, I, I, and I think, you know, this, this, this notion of knowing, we know that a lot of the uh, urban, a lot, lot, lot of the part of the world is, is actually urbanizing rapidly, right? You, you look at the numbers and there's, uh, you know, the minister talked about one Chicago a year 
of yeah. growth in India, and it's not you know if you look at Africa and other places. So there's incredible amount of infrastructure that's getting built as we speak, and we are still trying to figure out how do we incorporate all of the understanding of risks into that system. And actually, this does take me to the poll question. So we actually have a poll question for the audience. Um, I would encourage all of you to look um, the, for the audience. Look at there is a poll button uh, that you'll see. And the question really is, we want you to pick one gap from the following. Um, you know, pick a, from basically pick one of the following gaps that prevent cities from building resilient infrastructure. Is it lack of understanding about resilient infrastructure? Is it limited data on hazard information and risks? Is it decision making at state or national level with limited influence at the city level? Or is it outdated policies and standards? And I'll say it can be all of it, but I think we want you to actually choose the one that is the most important from your perspective. So I'll give you 30 seconds to make a determination and I'll give a breather to the panelists for you know, that 30 seconds and we'll come back. Um, so please, please do fill out that poll. And Sasha, we can see your cat again. I think we all, everybody enjoyed seeing that your cat. <laughs> um, Okay, hopefully we've got, you know, people have filled out the poll. Um, I will move now to the second round of questions, which will have to be a little bit faster. Uh, but Mayor, back to you. Uh, in your city and country's context, how do you see a focus on urban resilience contributing to the achievement of larger global commitments, such as the SDGs or Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction? So linking your... Um, focus on urban resilience with the larger global focus. So over to you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, it's my understanding that uh, if you look at each of the SDGs, we can easily realize that all of them need a place to happen. They don't happen on a vacuum. And that place, most of the times, or for most of SDGs, is the urban area or any other place where a local government is managing. So therefore, to me, if we want really to achieve SDGs, there is no other way than to work, coordinate with mayors, because actually mayors are on the forefront at the place where all these SDGs, or, or at least most of them, do happen. And if we incorporate, and if we mobilize mayors and local government, I think we can achieve them, achieve them at a, a faster speed, but also at a more, in a more sustainable way. That, that will be my un understanding of the relationship between local government and uh, SDGs. Thank you, Mayor. Loved your short response, but I think highlighting that it is SDGs are actually happening in a place, and often it is at the local level. And we, the importance of local government cannot be, um, you know, it, it, we we can't highlight that any less. And I think that goes back to the need to focus on urban resilience. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, David. Second question to you. Um, you've been working on a resilience for a while, city of Quito. From your point of view, what system, systemic, systematic changes or procedural changes do you believe are essential for planning for long-term resilience? And how can the CDRI, which is a coalition of national government uh, entities, how can they support the knowledge development process to build urban resilience? Thank you. Uh, I think um, this is a very important question. Um, I think uh, in, in, in a very um, concise way, uh, there are two parts. The first part is identifying specifically, specifically what are the challenges of the city that, make, that makes it more vulnerable. 
um, not only physically, but also socially. It has already been said um, a lot uh, in, in, in this panel. And I, and I think that is very important. Then the next question is uh, how, to, um, how to provide uh, proper answers and solutions to uh, those vulnerabilities. And um, I would like to uh, just um, um, highlight two points. And uh, that is that the way forward is uh, doing two things at the same time. Um, contributing to the SDGs, for example, or sustainable development, making sure that no one is left, no one is left behind but also planning for that process is to be resilient. And um, I think there is a wealth of knowledge uh, out in the world and um, sharing and, and, and supporting cities in this effort is probably the best contribution that the CDRI and of course, uh, cities networks like the Resilient Cities Network um, or the ICLE um, does is possibly the best, the best contribution uh, in our way forward. Thank you, David. Uh, again, thank you for being short and sweet. Um, I, you know, your two points are appreciated, specifically understanding how each city is vulnerable and then sharing lessons because people are exploring and experimenting and lessons are starting to emerge and sharing those lessons and building capacity is really important. Miss um, Stolp, from your perspective, I think it's the same question, frankly, because you're in a different context and you know, I want to see if there's any difference in your response. Uh, what systematic changes or procedural changes do you believe are essential for planning for long-term resilience? And then how can CDRI support the knowledge development process? Well, I would try to take a little bit another angle on this very, very important question. Well, I, I, I really do think that in, well-organized countries, uh, we need to have an other type of organization which goes right through all these offices within a city to address uh, the kind of shock organization or how are you going to organize it? When, because the shock stops everything. You need to have this, this go through all the offices and make everybody aware of how to deal with stress. So, so, so can we make some kind of systematic change within organizations, help those local uh, organizations to become more adaptive, actually? And, and then I think we don't have to forget that we need to have excellent relationships with urban stakeholders, knowledge institutes, but also with cooperation, because we do need to change the, the economy and the way we think to a more circular way of thinking and more circular economy. I was very inspired uh, with the story of, uh, of Major uh, Manuel Diajudo um, uh, about how do we get citizens uh, uh, involved within protecting the mangrove forest, but also to rethink the way we built. And, and I think this is, is extremely important that we are looking for this new kind of coalitions based on a trustworthy long-term relationship, because it is essential for companies too, that they contribute to society. They are part of society. They're not standing alone. It's not us defending society and they are, well, defending economy. I think if we want to have a welfare future together and a prosperous future and a thriving future, we need to cooperate in Triple Helix. And then, of course, we have to create this new normal and, and, and create new standards. So it's that it's because wherever you're living on earth you're living in a city you do want to do the same you want to you you want to live you want to work you want to take care of each other you you want to be educated and you want to have some spare time and and fill it and and and, and have a meaningful life and and how are we going to 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 make a new normal that the things that we're figuring out in Amsterdam can be easily put in procurement procedures and in policies and in standardized uh, regulation all over the world so that we can give a kind of leadership also to the to corporations that this is the kind of products and this is the kind of solution that we need and we need it because we are humans and we need 
and, and we live on Earth, and, and, and we also have to take into account that we live here with other creatures. Great. Thank you so much. I think it's interesting. It was the same question to David and you. You know, interesting responses from both of you. And I think I'll, I do appreciate when you talk about how the organizational structure of some of the more ad, you know, advanced cities is actually more stuck because you've already got a very strong institution in place. And sometimes yes. to break barriers within that institution is not easy, which makes it difficult to do more integrated level or you know, cross uh, boundary collaboration, which is needed for some of these new problems. Yeah. Uh, and also the partnerships with other institutions. I think that that's really important as well. Um, thank you so much, all okay. three of you. I am going to, you know, we did do a poll, so I want to, you know, I do want to come back and um, so the the amongst the top gaps that prevent cities from building uh, resilient infrastructure, 30% voted towards limited data. So that that was sort of the one of the most uh, got the highest ranking. The second one was decision making at the state and national level with little influence at the city level. I think that's important, especially because we're sitting in CDRI's context where, you know. National agencies can do certain things and local agencies can do other things. And, and there is a gap there sometimes. A lack of understanding of resilience infrastructure was about a quarter and then outdated, outdated policies and standards. So I think that was the priority that came out. Um, we do have a second poll, which also I'll conduct now. So go back to your polling button. Um, and this really focuses more on what CDRI should do. So. The question really is, the question is what support should CDRI prioritize and provide to cities to mainstream urban residents? And again, we'd like you to pick one, even though all of these are relevant, pick one. Uh, capacity development through training programs, technical support for risk assessments of cities, advocacy projects through workshops with national government agencies, and creating framework tools and techniques to support building urban resilience. So again, take 30 seconds, go to the poll and do, um, you know, make make your selection. Again, I'll come back in 10, I'll give you 10 seconds at this time and come back. Um, all right. We are coming towards the end of this, so I, I do want to uh, bring back Dr. T, uh, Dr. Tina Gomez. Um, I think, Dr. Gomez, we've, you've heard from all three panelists. We've had some really rich discussion. Um, I'd like to offer you a few moments to actually give your final reflections, and then I'll also come back to the three panelists for your final reflections. Uh, so, Dr. Gomez, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for the um, opportunity to like also extending this this session and giving us still this room for the final uh, reflection. I hope all the viewers are still, you know, also on board with us. But I definitely found it a super exciting discussion because in the run up for this session, we also had a discussion on how we could bring together these different perspectives because we have three very different cities represented here, um, but which. And very often in resilience, we will say, you know, the context is super important, which it is. But at the same time, we also see that structurally, some of the issues that are facing, like the complexity of dealing with urban issues, the pressure and sort of the development pressure that you have to adapt your city and accommodate for the people that live there, while then thinking about resilience, that is sort of the same for, for everybody. And then also very sort of strong and, and also very close to, to my heart, the need to work with, um, with the people that live there. So this uh, ideas of engaging the local population and empowering them also to help shape the, the city they are living in um, is very, very important. Um, a final point that came up a little bit in the discussion is uh, that we should not, of course, forget in all these urgent issues right now, the future and the future generations, because what was said somewhere in the, yeah, also by Sasha and, and by you, Amit, was that, of course, the infrastructures that we are planning now are incredibly persistent. Um, to the degree, like we are talking often about 50 or 100 years, but if you look at the road, road network of Europe, you see a lot still of the old 
Roman trade rates. So that's how persistent it is. So if we are planning a city now and planning the infrastructures we want to build in there, one key message is we are not just doing that to help the people that are living there now and that definitely need the space and need the infrastructure, need to be resilient, but we are also doing that for generations to come. But the difficulty is that, of course, we don't know what these people will need, how they will want to live, and they will, you know, if, you, if we just think like 40 years back, we are, we are living already now in a completely different world, um, let alone 100 years uh, back or, or even more. Um, so, and there, I do think that, you know, that the work that um, we are doing also with more model-based planning approaches, for instance, can definitely also help, as well as other approaches and tools. And I'm, yeah, super excited to sort of be part of this conversation. Thanks a lot for this opportunity again. Thank you so much, oh, Tina. One, one point, I, because sure, otherwise, sure, sure. We, yeah. we also have for the Urban Masterclass a quick... Um, survey that we would like to send out to you where we ex explicitly ask questions about you know how do you deal with these problems in your city and what do you think are the priorities um, for urban resilience in your in your context especially also with a long-term uh, vision in mind so that's for the urban masterclass people that are still watching this Great. So I think you're going to post that or somebody's going to post that in the chat box, right? So they should actually copy that. And also, I just want to highlight that if you had questions, I know we're running out of time, so we may or may not be get, able to get to it, but do post them to the Q&A box. So at least we have your questions and then we'll find some ways to get back some answers to you. Um, panelists, maybe 30 seconds of final comments and then I will hand it over to Jagan. So maybe Mayor uh, Arujo, 30 seconds, final thoughts. You're on mute, sir. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to add what uh, Tina and uh, Sasha mentioned. You know, this, I think that, that there is a huge need to bring together and create a platform where knowledge institutes, uh, local governments, and uh, institutions like uh, ICDR, I can bring all this together so that we can exchange experiences, but, 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 but also feed into each other's normal work. I think this will give us a kind of a leapfrog to, 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 to the future challenges, because I think that there is a lot of knowledge uh, 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 at universities, at the research in institutes that unfortunately probably it's, it's not being used by us, the practitioners, probably because we don't have access or we don't have the, the, the necessary tools or the necessary links. So I think that in, in institutions like uh, ICD RI could play a pivotal role. And uh, like what uh, Sasha was mentioning here, their experiences like about uh, 100 or 200 e e years ago may be probably very useful for the challenge that we are facing today, because Kalimari also is like, uh, is on a delta, you know, it's uh, on, on a swamp. So probably there are some uh, uh, lessons that uh, we could either from past or from the day to day that we could learn from cities like uh, those in Netherlands or Quito or others that we could use uh, to avoid most of these uh, issues that we face today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, David, final thoughts, 30 seconds. Yes. Um, well, it, I was just thinking um, that the global challenges that we uh, have right now require also uh, articulated and coordinated uh, actions. Uh, the pandemic is, uh, the coronavirus virus pandemic is only one example, then we have climate change and then we have biodiversity laws and so on. And um, these are all uh, fueled and, and, and propelled by the way we do things. And so we really need to rethink how we plan and how we work, first of all, inside our communities and inside our cities and so on, and so that we can amplify uh, these, these efforts. In, in, in that sense, um, I, I think we have to be uh, willing to really change our perspectives and, 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 and somehow look in different ways, be creative, and also get connected 
and see what others are doing and how they are solving these really complex uh, problems so that whenever it's uh, possible and, 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 and um, uh, feasible, then um, try to replicate those uh, same solutions. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate that. Sasha, 30 seconds. Yeah, final and final thoughts. And, and then I'm, again, an advocate for, for the corporate world because we need to have these new business cases. Then we can upscale the new normal. So, so in, in all our discussions, we, we need to incorporate them. And, and there are front runners who are willing to join us in, in the mission. And, um, well, and, and then I hope we have a prosperous future together. And thank you again for the opportunity for joining. And yeah, I, I, I really hope that we can make some sort of community uh, uh, from this event and, and that we can learn from each other with it because there's so much to learn from each other and to upscale to this new future-proof normal. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I am going to give Jagan Shah the final thoughts. Uh, Jagan is the Senior Infrastructure Advisor in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK government. And it's important that he give his final thoughts because we're also heading towards COP later this year. So I, you know, I would like to hear from him certain what he picked up today and what might be some messages that he may convey back to the UK government. So Jagan, over to you. And then I will come back to share Katie's image because she's been really, really working hard behind, behind the scenes. So Jagan, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Um, I've been, I've been listening, listening intently to the conversation. And in fact, I think what is very interesting is uh, to recall what Dr. John Merton, who is the UK's COP26 envoy, said in yesterday's policy forum. He said that the three priorities for COP26 are planning, action, and finance. And on action, he said that, you know, we tend to be very theory rich, but action light. Um, and what this session has uh, brought to the fore is that the actions happening at local levels. And we need to recognize that cities and city mayors and people who work on innovation in cities are the front line in terms of response to the impacts of climate change. So mitigation, adaptation, and resilience are embedded in action. And it's the cities, at least uh, in terms of urban infrastructure and urban uh, life, which are the front line. So that comes out in a very resounding way from this. Interestingly, as uh, uh, Mayor Arujo said, uh, almost in the passing, he said, uh, you know, they need to scale up from building a few resilient homes. They need to scale up. I think the idea of scaling up is crucial. And this is uh, something that will need to go to COP, which is that while it will be the meeting of national governments, it's going to have to find a way that national governments are able to talk about how local initiatives can scale up to national levels. Um, and, and that's going to be an important thing for us to take as a message. Um, I want to very quickly kind of scan my notes here for what I think came across across uh, the presentations by uh, four speakers as a very rich number of issues that have come up. Um, I think a resounding issue has been local action, and that's uh, participative. It is uh, the way that Sasha called it, the quadruple helix. Um, all stakeholders working together, including the private sector, and the private sector is crucial here because, um, as John Merton said yesterday, governments should create the policy and environments, but it's the private sector that brings the innovation. So uh, whether it is uh, Mayor Arujo's, uh, you know, resilient houses, which take us away from using mangrove material, um, or it is uh, shifting from using mangroves as biomass for cooking to biogas, this is the kind of initiative which will well up or bubble up to a national level. And I think we need to keep that uh, idea of the innovation ecosystem and the quadruple helix very much at the center of our thinking. Um, the other very important point which David brought up was food security. Food is one of the uh, causes for um, uh, a, a lot of the instability that comes in the macro system, uh, you know, and affects climate. Um, and to take food to the local level 
agriculture happening at urban level also means that the footprint of food production reduces. And that is a very important aspect of the future as we go forward, uh, along with the mega trends that Sasha talked about, cyber, demographic, climate. And Tina reminded us that we need to keep our focus on future generations. Food production is going to be one of the key issues. And we must keep that at the center of our conversations on adaptation and resilience. Um, I think Tina brought up uh, the important point, which I think even in the survey you brought out, um, is the importance of data. Uh, one of the themes at COP is going to be about the need for national governments to enable more granular, more accurate data to be available, both at community levels, but also at a sectoral level. So the private sector or large infrastructure companies that operate uh, power or transportation infrastructure can use that to inform their thinking. So this is built into one of the uh, very big campaigns called the Risk-Informed Early Action um, Partnership, which will look at early warning systems and how they can get embedded into adaptation planning uh, at all levels from national to the local. Um, I think we did get a very strong sense here of the planning imperatives. And again, I want to refer to Mayor Arujo's uh, several times he mentioned that let's not forget that Kilimane is, is planned on a swamp on the banks of a river and is uh, has multi-hazard vulnerabilities. Now, clearly, whoever chose to locate the city did not have climate change uh, on, on the horizon as, as, as an issue. But now we are well informed that the location of our installations of infrastructure, the locations of cities or new developments is key. And planning that in the most appropriate way, connecting it in a way that local communities do not have to bear the brunt of climate impact would be key over here. And I think I'd like to just end on the importance again that Mayor Arujo brought out what he called the permanent education plan for communities. Communities need to be informed. And uh, the more aware a community is, whether it is in Quito, uh, you know, about urban agriculture, or it is about mitigation of the impacts of climate change uh, in, in cities across the world, the more likely we are going to be to, uh, to build the resilience to handle climate change. So um, I think there are a lot of very interesting messages, very granular detail that has come out of these conversations. And to me, what is fascinating is that the big words, mitigation, adaptation and resilience, you know, the big stuff actually finds a, a life and manifests itself. Uh, in the stories that we've heard from uh, from our colleagues from the cities. Um, and I think that's a very, very important message. Thanks. Thank you, Jagan. That was an excellent closing. Um, so no more comments from me, except I do want to share on the poll, the second poll. Um, all of you said that, you know, or nearly 40% or more than 40% said creating frameworks, tools, and techniques to support building urban resilience. That's, that was what you would like CDRI to do. Um, the second one was capacity building through training programs, technical support for risk assessments, and the last one was ad advocacy projects through workshops with national government agencies. Um, so thank you very much for the poll. And Katie, we would love to see your drawing, your graphic. I see the COVID reference. I see the the Chicago reference. Amit, while we're watching this, if I, if I may just say that uh, I think one very important thing that also came up was the man-nature balance, and that's central to resilience, and thanks to Sasha's cat. So I think we should recognize <laughs> <laughs> the importance of that balance. That's right. Ur urban ecology. <laughs> um, Sandeep ji, I'm going to hand it back to you as this graphic is unfolding. So it's over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Amit. This was really a fascinating session. From Amsterdam to Mozambique to Quito, we had city leaders from different geographies and academic experts as well as practitioners uh, like Professor Tina Combs. Uh, Amit Prothi and Jagan. So thank you everyone for this fascinating discussion. 
on urban resilience. I heard many uh, quotes from gap between the theory and action. Infrastructure is about people. It's not only about physical infrastructure and the social and economic infrastructure. So, and Sasha repeatedly mentioned the importance of institutions and how it is difficult to modify or change them in view of the changing environments. And one more thing, I, I really like the example of uh, uh, city of Amsterdam with walls trying to fight a war uh, with aeroplanes. So I think that really exemplifies the, the rationale for changing our thinking about what the future may hold. So thank you everyone. Thank you uh, Amit. Thank you Professor Combs. Thank you all the three city leaders from different geographies and thank you Jagan who has been working with CDRI for a long time. So thank you everyone for a fascinating discussion. Uh, this was the second last session of today and we will be meeting again at uh, 8 p.m. India time for our regional session on the small island developing states in the Caribbean. So see you back then. Thank you. Thank you.